Welcome to the Braemar Life Skills Academy podcast. The world is changing faster than ever, and the world of education is too. Advances in psychology, biology, and a whole range of other fields have opened up new lines of thought about the purpose of school and how it can best serve a new generation of students. Join me on the Braemar Life Skills Academy podcast every week to explore these new ideas. In our last episode, I spoke with two of our students, Alexander Malinen and Alexander Simpson, about their experience of international study and the strategies that they use to succeed in the classroom. Very pleased to be joined today uh, by a fellow staff member, also a, a fellow traveler on the, the journey towards health and actualization, Mr. James Olson. Mr. Uh, Olson, tell the folks at home a little bit about yourself. Uh, how did you come to be here? How did you come to be an educator? Uh, how did you come to have the interests that you have? It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks so much, Mike. Um, so how I came to be here, um, kind of a roundabout question, but I um, started in business. So I do teach the business programs. So I guess I'll start with my business experience. Um, so I read history at Queens in my undergrad. Um, a couple of years later, a couple of years work experience, um, did my MBA and scholarship uh, in Boston. Um, came back 2017, joined Braemar, and the rest is history. <laughs> history at the beginning and at the end. I like that. I think that, that actually gives me a cue as to why we enjoy conversations with one another so much. There's a history background there. I did my, uh, my undergrad in history as well. And I think there's a way of thinking about the world that comes with that, that kind of education. Like you and me are both very uh, uh, problem. There's a book for that. Right. Go out and read, go out and find what, what intelligent people have to say about it. And then there's there's a real intentionality to your not just your approach as a teacher, but your life, your lifestyle that I've admired for a long time and that you and I talk about quite a lot. Um, but I, I'm interested in, in how much that comes out of uh, that type of undergrad background and those types of studies. Um, we are going to be developing our, our habits and our routines here uh, at the Braemar podcast for some time. Uh, we're still in the midst of, of designing the studio, and, and I'm very much in the midst of cultivating a, a podcast host personality. Um, but we would like to start, I think, each of these podcasts with uh, with one big question. Um, Braemar Academy or Braemar College is a an international uh, academy here in downtown Toronto, and so pretty much everything we talk about on this podcast is going to be related in some way to uh, education, the, the history of education, the current situation, where it's going, and especially how that might affect an international student looking to, to expand their horizons. Um, if I were to ask you, what is your ideal position or relation to education? Where, where would you most like to exert influence and, and participate? Um, obviously a very open-ended question, but I'll, I'll leave it there. How do you see your relationship to education? Um, my kind of ideal experience um, in education has always been uh, in a private context. Um, so um, graduate degree, but also um, uh, going abroad when I was in um, high school myself um, was with a uh, private company going, going abroad uh, over a summer. Um, and I think my highest performing educational experiences have been with um, outside of the public system within a private um, kind of orientation um, and I think that speaks to um, the superiority, superiority excuse me of the quality that we're able to provide mm -hmm. to students um, and I think that we um, celebrate the public system and that we're um, kind of um, averse to um, um, deploring or uh, denigrating <laughs> The public education system yeah, because proper, they're amazing proper teachers. Canadians up in here. <laughs> public is the best way. Um, but I think on occasion we should um, celebrate um, what our advantages are and I think those are superior quality. I think that you can't match the quality of attention we give our students um, here as opposed to um, another system um, and that matches my philosophy in yeah, so, education. Yeah. So ideally you're, you're someone who's going to be participating in that type of I don't want to say highly curated, but but much more intensive, engaged, small classrooms, um, an individual focus on the student, and a chance to build real, like real relationships with them as 
as opposed to some of what we see, I think, today in the in the public system and in other schools where you get so little direct contact with a student. There's no real chance to get to know their, you know, their 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 multiple intelligences, their learning styles, their their lifestyle, you know, where they're coming from, what triggers them, all that all that kind of stuff. That I think you need um, if you're ever going to have a real lasting impact on their their education. Um, over the past months, uh, in the in the midst of this pandemic period, and, and in the midst of, of quite a lot of uncertainty, I think not just for for the students and their families, but for everybody here at Braemar, we have uh, been in the process of launching the Braemar Life Skills Academy, BLSA. Um, and today, we want to talk about how that idea came about, uh, what it's in response to, uh, what it will hopefully look like, and and how it's going to function in the lives of our students. Amazing. It's not something that we've we've implemented uh, directly yet. It's it's kind of trickled in over over the last few months, and and of course we're we're very much in an experimental phase because there just aren't a ton of models uh, to follow. We mm. can't really look to a lot of different schools um, and and see this type of program. We may see parts of it, and, and I think one of the things we're seeing in the evolution of education in the last ten years is um, a sort of a dissonance or maybe even a, a, a lack of good faith around the types of evolutions that, that neuroscience and uh, uh, psychology and a lot of the other fields that are producing these wonderful findings about how people learn and how they find themselves in a, in a position to, to be their best selves, to be their authentic selves. We see a lot in education, um, uh, what's the phrase? They're, they're paying lip service to things like <laughs> right. to, like a physical education program or to things like a music program or to outdoor education or to mindfulness interventions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and so BLSA is something that we, we want to do without paying lip service to those things. We really want to, mm. to integrate um, all of those aspects and more uh, into the life of our students. But, but I've said it probably enough as way, by way of introduction. Um, mm. How do you see... Uh, extracurricular, co-curricular, and even intercurricular um, ways in which holistic health plays a big role in, in the, the experience of a student. Amazing. And I totally agree that there's a huge um, lack of emphasis in the curriculum yeah. about these elements. And also that it hasn't been done perhaps before and that um, we have an opportunity to be um, pioneers and le leading the way on integrating uh, holistic curriculum. Um, but in terms of integrations, um, I mean, so critical uh, to have a physical component to do physical education. Um, we don't often think about it, but important to emphasize that um, we're not separate from our bodies. There's a connection and that we cannot um, uh, separate ourselves from our, our physical beings. Um, the expression, I guess, as above, so below. Mm. That when you, I notice this myself. When I, um, I can change my mood when I'm feeling bad. I'll feel better if I'm working out. When I'm not treating my body well, my mind suffers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's so important for for students uh, to to get started in this and um, make it something that they continue further on in their life. But giving them the tools to make a physical education plan and setting an, an example for, for um, being physically active, pursuing these things. This is why I love talking to you because like, I think you, you can speak about two sentences and I'll find maybe like five connection points to jump off of. I think so, we have a lot of connections. I think so. I think so. Uh, I'm going to have to work on securing those connections as they pop up in the midst of, a, uh, of our conversation so I don't lose out on the important stuff. My man just quoted the Vedantic texts, as above, so below. No big deal. Just pulling that out of nowhere. Um, it should be said for the, for the listeners at home that uh, Mr. Olson is primarily a, a business teacher, and I think the focus is, is on business uh, in a lot of your personal life and a lot of your uh, thoughts about education. But you've also very generously and very capably taken over the uh, Braemar Physical Education Department and have been running uh, those classes for our grades 9, 10, and 11 for, for quite a few semesters now. Um, it's so a privilege. I, it's it's such an enjoyable class to teach. Like, definitely, I mean, it goes without saying that it's it's a lot of students' favorite class to take, and and for obvious reasons. But it's also a ton of fun to teach. Um, I was lucky enough to to teach it a few times before you, and it's it's even been fun handing it off and and watching how you've run with it. Um, 
Brain My Life Skills Academy is focused on the in, the health as a a multi vectored interconnected um, uh, you know theory of being, but physical education seems to be uh, right down at the foundation of whatever we mean by holistic health. And uh, you talked about getting to the brain through the body, and this is not something we see a lot in just about any other class outside of, of that PPL or that physical education class, right? You're not getting to the brain through the body in a traditional math class or, or you know, your traditional humanities classes. You, in fact, you're bringing a student out of a highly socialized position, whether it's in the hallways or outside on their way to school or uh, what have you. And then putting those classes are, I'm sure they're amazing. Great classes. Don't get the physical. Yeah. <laughs> we got to have it all. Um, but we, we, I think a lot of the times in that traditional education setting, we, we tend to ignore that idea of the, the, what, what bodies are we teaching right now? Are they highly stressed bodies? Mm -hmm. Are they exhausted bodies? Right? Because as you say, the brain is of course, part of the body. We tend to, to forget that we tend to draw a hard line in between those two. But if you are exhausted, if you're highly anxious, highly stressed, if you're going through something like depression or if there's trauma in your life, uh, if you're going through a relationship breakup or a tough time with a friend, very difficult to learn calculus in that moment, <laughs> right? So I want to go back to, to the physical education and just ask, wh what have you experienced while teaching that class in terms of student engagement, um, student behavior, personality, uh, health indicators? What do you see in the lives of your students as they take that class, either on a daily basis or, or over the course of a term? Um, I should start, it's such a privilege to have the chance to teach people physical education and to sure do is. workouts and, and experience that. Um, in terms of transformations, I should say um, the PPL curriculum, um, to use another phrase, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants as I'm using your uh, previous <laughs> curriculum. Now, who said that? Here's the test. Oh, I love it. I think like a 19th century genius mathematician. Like, like there's Albert Einstein and then there's... I want to say Canadian, but no. <laughs> Scientist, uh, let me... Apple fell Dar on his head. Darwin? No. Good guess. Yeah, contemporary. Isaac Newton. But uh, he was also, pun intended, standing on the shoulders of giants when he said it. I think it was Bernard de Chartres. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong too, Chartres. Um, yeah, he was the first guy to say it. And uh, the only reason I know that is because it's fun to talk about uh, Isaac Newton standing on the shoulders of giants when talking about standing on the shoulders of giants. Anyways, I've interrupted you for something no. quite pedantic. <laughs> Sorry. Amazing that Newton would think he's on the shoulders of giants. Of I course. know. Yeah. Great point. Uh, sorry, physical, where were PPL? Or, <laughs> yeah, I've completely derailed this to make some stupid... Maybe we should just talk about liberal arts things and sure. humanities. I think uh, we have a lot of entry points here. Uh, physical education, what do you see in the lives of your uh, your students as they go through that program? I think a huge... Um, what I hope is a huge transformation. I'm not sure to the extent to which I'm living up to the expectations that have been set, but... Um, I'm not sure if my students would agree that the <laughs> expectations were met if taught by the previous owner of the course. Context is everything. Um, I do see transformation, though, change in their well-being. Um, over the course of the term, you have a lot of chances to um, kind of uh, brush up and, and um, hone in on um, things that you wouldn't be able to do if it was just like a workout session, for example. Um, so um, being able to, to do that repeatedly, I think is helpful. Um, a change in outlook, I'd hope. I, I, um, yeah, I think just trying to provide an example um, and, and get people um, to start developing working out habits, physical, um, physical plan, getting involved more. Um, I guess that's the end, end goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like the, the point about you, you almost have to be like a, a personal trainer, a coach, uh, a, a therapist, a, a, a psychologist, uh, a, a, you know, um, a physiotherapist all at once for, for these students. And that can be Absolutely. overwhelming as a teacher. I think it can, it can even be overwhelming as a student, but it's also maybe the only time outside of 
of having a kid of your own and, and, and teaching them in this way, uh, where you're not just, let's say, in the, in the case of a personal trainer, you're not just training this kid uh, for a specific physical result, mm-hmm. right? You're training them in the context of a much, much bigger idea of quote-unquote success and quote-unquote health, right? So it's, it's one thing when you get the kid who walks in and he, he can bang out 50 push-ups and he's already in that position as a, a, you know, a physical person. But then to be able to explain how 50 push-ups in that capacity might fit into a life of a, the life of a, a lifelong learner or, you know, the life of a, a successful uh, family person or, you know, the life of a, a, a university graduate, right? How do, you, how do you integrate this? What is going on in your brain? What's going on in your hormonal system? How does this affect your social life, et cetera? There's all these, these interconnected points. And again, a personal trainer or a coach has very, very limited access to that. But as a, as a PPL teacher, as somebody who's helping out a lot with uh, the Braemar Life Skills Academy, we have access to a lot of those vectors. And it, again, overwhelming, but also exciting and very cool. Um, Can I pick up on that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so just going, um, dialing back to that question about um, what are the changes in people that you see? Um, just to expand on that a little bit, getting a chance to... Um, sit down with the students and and have them set goals and achieve goals the change that they um hopefully that we get to is the objective but i'm not sure if we get it every time is to get them really passionate get them interested in something um and having the the chance to do that um over the term many classes um i think you get a chance to sit down with them and find their passion mm-hmm. and their their interests um and point them in that direction yeah yeah um what is the biggest obstacle or what are the one or two biggest obstacles standing in the way of a young person um achieving a physical practice a a healthy physical Mm -hmm. routine in their lives amazing question (laughs) um i think smartphones huge barrier i mean how many times are we going to give that answer in this podcast (laughs) Yeah, that could be the answer to all of life's ills, but sorry. Go I on. think it is like the huge, what the huge threat to health of, of our age. Um, that may be overstating it, but I think it is, it is pretty detrimental, mm-hmm. detrimental to our mindfulness, focus, attention, so many, so many different areas. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah. I forgot the question. <laughs> what were we, what were we it, was a, it was a perfect answer to the question. But uh, yeah, what are the big obstacles that stand in the way of young pre- people becoming physically active or, or developing what we know is one of the most important and foundational aspects of a healthy life, which is, is a routine, right? A, a physical routine that doesn't occupy a lot of stressful space in their life. It's not something that they wake up fearing or, or you know, you know, that nasty feeling. We say, oh, I have to do this thing. What, what's... What's keeping, I would what I would say is the majority of young people from getting past that that early phase and, and developing a, a healthy relationship with their bodies and with their physical routines. Um, I think one objective we might share this is incorporating play. I know you're a big sports guy. As a, I'm just as a big my... kid. <laughs> <laughs> I learned this about myself as well. You never grow up as a teacher, apparently. Um, but there's hope. <laughs> so yeah, incorporating play, removing any distractions. Um, so any of the things like Netflix, social media, something that'll take you away from doing something that's more beneficial for you. Um, just related to the analogy of a diet, this may be a tangent, but um, we know we can train our bodies to. Um, appreciate and be more interested in um, healthy and nutritious things to make this um, more attractive for us, more flavorful Mm -hmm. uh, on occasion. I've tried to train myself like this, and um, I think um, I've learned from other people um, how to do it. But I think the same can be said for for sports and doing um, physical things, getting our bodies moving. Um, Just give give it a shot, develop a positive feedback loop, train yourself to enjoy the nutritious elements of life. Mm-hmm. That's nicely That's said. That's my analogy. Yeah. We probably should say that more, the nutritious elements of life. <laughs> um, there's a, again, with every sentence that you speak, there's a few different ways or pathways that I want to take from it. 
Um, I want to talk about openness and how we encourage openness uh, in, in students' lives. But I guess the, the one thing that, that keeps hitting me, um, and I think it should hit all teachers, is that is the nature of the spaces that we create in our classrooms, whatever the mm. curriculum may be. Um, they are first and foremost meant to be experimental spaces, right? If a, if a young person, I'm imagining That's myself at, at 16 to 18 years old, and I remember what it felt like to walk into my first weight rooms, right? The, the first time when I realized, oh, if I'm going to be a, if I'm going to get to that next level of athletics, I might need to start actually, you know, training my body in a more intentional way. You can't just go out and play basketball every day. And that feeling walking into the weight room was, was an ugly one. It was intimidating. Mm. It was deeply insecure. Um, it was confused, doubtful, uh, ignorant, right? I, I walked in and you almost get hit like deer in headlights. You realize I have no idea what I'm doing in here. Right. And just that idea, just that, that sensation, knowing that I, I felt that probably kept me from developing a proper routine or a proper healthy, positive, joyful, mm. playful relationship with, uh, with exercise for a few years. That was like the primary mm. obstacle that stood in the way because I didn't have for a while that experimental safe space, right? This wasn't something that was dealt with in my, my early thousands, my early two thousands phys ed classes, right? We were still very much in that age where, uh, an educator would come to the gym and roll the balls out and Today we're playing uh, soccer, Brutal. guys. Yeah. It's going to be 75 minutes of soccer. <laughs> I was perfectly happy with that. But again, combination of that insecurity, that doubt, and, and just that straight up ignorance made developing what should be a fundamental habit in our lives, right? For, as, as far as I'm concerned. What do you think you'd be without, if you were received that? <sighs> I've thought about this a lot. First round draft. <laughs> First round draft pick. Uh, where would I be without um, that obstacle or without, without the, the obstacle. exercise routine? Without the obstacle, I think I probably would be pretty much where I am career-wise and health-wise now. I've had about 10 years where I think I've had a pretty healthy relationship with it. Um, but I think I would have a lot less pain in my body, first <laughs> right. of all. Um, the, the workouts that I was doing when I was young were deeply uninformed, right? And, and mm. what they were informed by was what I might call a, a meathead culture, just like... Um, you know, having seen the, those kind of Arnold Schwarzenegger types, just pump in iron, right? Lift something heavy, put it over your head, put it back down on the floor. And I, I think I caused myself some, some pretty premature knee pain, back pain, you know, joint issues that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm having to work quite hard as a early 30 year old to, um, <laughs> to overcome. So yeah, I think I would have just been in a much healthier position. I would have had a much um, more positive relationship with my body. That's another mm -hmm. aspect um, that I think we don't really talk about very much, even in, like I had to learn to teach this in physical education, that you do have a, a subject-object type relationship with your body. But there's also, mm -hmm. much like this conversation, there are interesting subjectivities uh, at play there. Like the body does speak to you in, in its own language. And so I, I guess my second answer to that question, in addition to avoiding a lot of pain, I probably would have encouraged a lot of trust uh, in my body earlier in my life and have become much mm -hmm. more fluent in, in the language of the body, the, diff the differing pain signals, signals for exhaustion, um, knowing exactly how far I can push myself in different settings. Um, and that's something I'm, I'm still working on. But those two things don't come to mind too often when you talk about traditional athleticism traditional exercise mm -hmm. they certainly come to mind now as i'm beginning to get over that hill head and head into that that downhill slope of life so the objective of maintaining a, a connection with your body getting that done through animal flow mm -hmm. yoga um any of these activities um we do it and then hopefully it lasts um that you have greater understanding um later in life mm -hmm. when you're mid thirties or we shouldn't mention age, but yeah. <laughs> at this stage, I do want to circle back to, um, that big question. Why, why this, this general Braemar life skills Academy approach? Why now? Um, so I'm going to ask you to hold me to that, uh, in the, in the next few minutes, but we've talked so far very much about the, the, the physical body as a vector for health. And I think that's quite natural when we think health, we think of, of the physical body or the physiological body. But I think what we're finding, certainly what's been a major turning point in my career, um, you know, reading a lot of the books like we were talking about before the start mm -hmm. of the podcast and even having so much access to super informative uh, figures, a lot mm -hmm. of the time through podcasts themselves, 
Mm-hmm. Um, it's become quite clear to me and I think quite clear to you and, and quite clear to, to many educators that there is so much more to our students' health than just the body. Um, and so with the Braemar Life Skills Academy, our efforts have been uh, quite widespread or quite broad. We want to approach a bunch of different vectors of health, recognizing that they are all interconnected, that For example, you can't really exercise effectively and develop a physical practice without a proper nutritional practice, without a nutritional routine in your life, or or at least a basic foundation of knowledge. Um, Sleep ends up being this this massively influential vector on everything. Again, Mm. you're not going to be able to process that that good, healthy, nutritional uh, food that you've dedicated yourself to understanding if you haven't had good sleep, right? It all kind of falls apart. Sleep is, is affected by relationships, by, by your mental health, by the health of your community, by your environmental situation, uh, by your finances, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a weird underlying assumption, I think, that's made in education, which is that we are sending our students towards adulthood and that there is some sort of hard dividing line between an adolescent or a, a child, a kid, as we often call them or catch ourselves calling them, and an adult, right? For sure. We talk about, like, getting them ready for life. And I think we often, <laughs> innocently, yeah. in most, in most uh, cases, it. forget that they're in the midst of their lives, <laughs> right? That this is their life. And so uh, I'd love to sort of pivot into a broader consideration of um, how our students, capital H, health, uh, influences their, their time in school, their learning in the classroom, and even their future uh, prospects towards a life of, again, quote, success. Where, where do you see us doing well? Where do you see students' health um, in all of its different expressions being supported and met? And maybe in, in general, you can think back to your time in, in education as, as a student or your time um, as an educator yourself. Where can we improve? What, what, what are we missing when it comes to the, the health lives of our students? Amazing question. It's a big question. Sorry to give you a <laughs> pr- pretty big runway there. That's huge. Um, well, first of all, if I can mention that I, I totally agree with the analogy of preparing them for life versus recognizing that they're actually in life, of course. Um, and I think this goes into having a respect for the student and that to not be pedantic, but be pedagogical making that differentiation, but having just respect for the student. Um, mm. they're, we're not preparing them for life. They're, they're living life, of course. Um, in terms of the gaps where we can improve or what our goal should be, um, I think the major development, or major areas of personal development, which we often chat um, surrounding sleep, less screen time, Mm. physical activity, Mm -hmm. nutrition. Um, I'm just trying to think of real gaps um, with our students. It might be worth mentioning, so many of our students are actually pretty developed and pretty pretty good. We have some great athletes. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, we have have some great everything. We have some some really intimidating thinkers. Like I get myself, I'll drop in on Mr. Dunsmore's um, philosophy and debate club on Fridays at lunch, or even listening to some of the conversations going on Wednesdays at lunch with your uh, entrepreneurs club. And if I'm lucky, I can remember what I would have thought or said as a 16 year old in that moment. And I got to tell you, as a, as a 30 something year old, I can, in some cases, barely capture what's being said. Like I'm just on the edge of comprehension with some of these students' thoughts. Um, and I, I, I have a few in my mind. I'm not going to say them by name, but I think we're probably thinking of a few of the same students. Some good guys. And it, like in Angels. some cases, I would have I would have looked at these students as peers if I was 16 alongside them, like they had two heads. Like they, <laughs> they are so impressive. It's it's remarkable. I think we're lucky to be at an international school where students have already been through a major transition, at least one major transition mm-hmm. in their life. Uh, Almost all of our students are bi or tri or quadlingual, so they have these mm. these parts of their brains that have been active when my poor little monolingual brain has, has not been. Um, and yeah, that that old uh, cliche ends up being remarkably true that you do learn more as a as a teacher than you, you do as a student. Like sitting alongside 100%. them, I don't, I don't, I, I'm I want to be careful not to make it sound like every child is in 
uh, you know, some desperately unhealthy situation and they're, they're, you know, falling apart at this, at the first sign of any obstacle. They're not, they're remarkably resilient. They're remarkably imaginative. Um, and they come with an energy, which is, is contagious. We want to maximize that. Right. We're really concerned with maximizing that. So I've, I've cut you off again for a long diatribe, no. but, um, yeah. Do you see anything there to, to continue on? Um, absolutely. Have you ever noticed when you walk into the classroom, sometimes you're not the smartest person in the room. Terrifying. <laughs> Is that phenomenon ever occurred to you? Um, which speaks to the level of talent, obviously, if you can be so educated and spend your time with the subject and then, um, have somebody else pick it up so quickly and, and be able to share it with you. It's, it's yeah, I'd, I'd be lying if I said I, it wasn't with a begrudging acceptance that I, I view that fact. There not are, often, but so. No, yeah. not <laughs> often, but th there are people who are half my age and uh, at least twice as intelligent as me, which is oh, for sure. frustrating and inspiring at the same time. <laughs> well put. Um, Can I throw it back on you? Maybe do you want to speak about what are the best... Um, development, um, holistic health practices you've had for yourself in the classroom mm. as well. Thanks for the question. Uh, always tough to try to capture everything that you'd want to say in this, and hopefully we'll have more and more opportunities to have conversations like this and, and really, um, over time paint with a pretty broad brush when it comes to this stuff. The, the one thing that's become incredibly clear to me in my personal life, in my own my own personal pursuit of health, as well as anything I've tried to do with the, with our student programs, is that there are at least two different major kinds of motivation. I might call them mm -hmm. push pull, or we talk about the the carrot and the stick. Um, what I've personally experienced, and and I think that this is true in a more universal way, if not a completely universal way, is that the pull motivation is a great deal more long lasting or produces more long lasting results. Can than, you articulate the pull versus pull? For sure. Push first. Um, I might call the pull something like joy, something I, I the, okay. the phrase that I want to kind of circle around here that my, my big lesson that, that I've learned and that has ended up being remarkably true over time, uh, is that if you want to succeed long term, if you want to develop some of these health habits that we spend so much time thinking and talking about, you've got to run towards joy not away mm. from fear, right? Run towards joy, not away from fear, or not away from unpleasantness, discomfort, confusion, et cetera. Uh, we motivate our young people especially, and we motivate our, ourselves especially, so often with negative talk. If you don't do this, then this awful thing will happen to you. Oh, if you, if you don't pass this class, right? Yeah. If, you, if you don't complete your CA, if you, if you don't, uh, if you aren't able to do 20 push-ups, in the next week, whatever, then dun, dun, dun. Mm -hmm. And that can spur action in the moment. Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced that it spurs long-term healthy action, mm -hmm. running towards joy, right? Identifying things that really bring you those, maybe it's not pure joy, but maybe it's, it's a sense of peacefulness or calm, a sense of control, a sense of belonging, purposefulness, fulfillment, order, all of those things that I think make a meaningful life. Um, that pull, when I say pull motivation, it ends up being uh, much more sustainable and much stronger. And so the, w let's go back to physical exercise because it's probably the easiest metaphor we can use here. But when I had coaches screaming at me and when I had the threat of a couple thousand fans watching us play our game on Friday night, <laughs> um, when I had the, you know, the, the meatheads next to me in the gym, all of that was motivating, right? All of that made me, me work pretty hard in the gym. It also made me have a really negative connotation, negative association with that entire world, with the, with the whole mm. lifestyle. I did not relish, I did not love or look forward to the idea of going to the gym or getting a run. In the years since I've gotten out of that structure, when I've had no coach looking over my shoulder at my, my workout plans and making sure I woke up at six in the morning to go for that 10K run, and when I don't have to worry about so much about how people perceive me, as a physical self anymore. There's been so much more room for play, as you've said, play. and for and just for, for joy. Like, it is so much easier to get out for a run when you know that the act of putting your shoes on is the win, right? 
Like, all, yeah. I got to tell me all, all I got to tell myself is just put the shoes on. What comes next? Uh, left foot, right foot in the sunshine, breathing, <laughs> breathing heavy, right? Having to That's worry good. about nothing, putting some music on, <laughs> listening to a podcast, right? Seeing people smile on the sidewalk. The, the health, the health um, expressions that come your way when that negative motivation goes away and it just becomes a pull, like, are remarkable. Like, my run is therapy for me in a, in a very, very uh, real way. Like I come out of my run in a different headspace in a much healthier uh, headspace. And it's not motivated by that fear of, oh, if I don't do this, then dot, dot, dot. So we could talk about that when it comes to food. I love that you mentioned like the, the solution to eating healthier or the problem of healthy eating is not how do I discipline myself? How do I limit these bad things that I eat? But rather, how do I get as much joy as possible out of healthy food? How many different cool cuisines, cool meals can I make? How much can I enjoy my time in the kitchen? Can I enjoy my time at the grocery store? Can I develop a relationship with a few of the, the people that work there? Can I, can I talk nutrition with my friends? All of that is joy motivated solution crafting towards a healthier diet. The balance of, of macronutrients in your diet and particularly the recommendation for vegetables as 50% greens mm -hmm. and proteins 25. And after I've read all your materials and obviously implemented it. It's been a game changer for me. Eat those healthy greens. You feel amazing. Yeah. And I look forward to it. Like, what do you think of what's the situation in like traditionally whereby don't eat that junk you should eat. Yeah. It's yeah. It's an adult screaming at you, right? Or, or a mother kind of tutting you. hundred percent. Right? You're not allowed to leave the table until you finish that broccoli, Michael. Right. <laughs> I had some of that growing up. And in that moment, it made me eat my vegetable. It also almost guaranteed that I had a really negative association with vegetables. As you say, now, one of my favorite things to do is I, I don't care what the carb or the starchy carb base is. It could be rice, could be potatoes, could be noodles, anything. But I'm looking forward to the stir fried veg because I was able to develop a joyful relationship with them. Those associations, when I eat kale and I feel my whole body going boop, 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 when I'm recharged, Same I think feeling. I probably would have missed that in years past when I only thought of kale as the thing that I had to eat because mom told me to. Being given the space, the knowledge, the, the ability to experiment in unpressured settings and to find my own individual connection with the, the health practice, but let's say in this case with vegetables, is the only reason that I have a consistent uh, routine when it comes to them. Otherwise, it would, it would all be forced. It would all be really negative, and I think it would be radically inconsistent. The benefits of the pull strategy, working towards something, I think that application in planning and goals for students, mm -hmm. so setting your objective and then watching how things materialize around you as you work towards a goal. I, I was hoping to, <laughs> to make some sort of connection with smart planning and five-year planning. Well, and... I think we did the same curriculum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, it's nice that you brought that up. Smart planning, S-M-A-R-T, probably something oh. that a lot of the listeners are at least tangentially familiar with. And I know there's an advancement on that. That's it's smarter now, S-M-A-R-T-E-R. -E this What's is an -E acronym. Sorry, go on. What's the ER? I haven't heard that one. The ER is evaluate and reflect, I believe. Nice. So there's all these RE words. It might be retry or uh, revise. It's one of those two, but evaluate and some sort of the end. coming back to the beginning and doing it again, but doing it better in, in response to that evaluation. For those who don't know, smart planning is something that's really taken the business world, especially by storm in the last 10 years, 50 more? years ago, 50 years. <laughs> okay. I'm, yeah. I'm way behind the it's times not, on not this a reason. one. It's not as radical yeah. as the Canada 2019 food guide, but planning in a way that is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely is not something that was mentioned to me once in all my years as a teenager or early adult. It's something that I came across while planning the phys ed curriculum. It's ended up becoming that the central unit or the first unit in that course. And we've also built a whole intervention for new students program around this idea. Where do you see planning fitting in the lives of a young person? Why don't we see more of this? What makes it so difficult or, or maybe odious to do? And what are the, the short and long-term benefits of being somebody who has an intentional, an agency, if you will, in, in the actual laying out of one's life? This is an amazing question. I think that's our main objective as teachers, as educators, is helping students find their passion, what they're interested in, their bliss, 
<laughs> Got another Andrew Bruce baby. Yeah. <laughs> Sweetness and light. Let's get it. But finding what they're really interested in and then setting a plan to reach that goal, whatever it may be, a hobby, whatever in their lives that they're that they're interested in. As soon as you have your passion, you set a goal and then your experience is your progression towards that goal. I agree completely. Did you have a planner when you were in, let's say, high school? I did. I had about t- between 2,000 and 2,500 students in my uh, high school, and we were given 2,000 to 2,500 planners at the beginning of every single year. And they were branded, and they had all kinds of advertising and lots of clever ways to, to move through them and organize your day. I'm going to go ahead and guess that between 1,800 and 2,200 of those planners ended up in the school garbage can <laughs> at some point in the first week of school. It's like I, And I started every single year saying to myself, this is the year. I'm going to plan. And I probably did spend that first week like actually writing down my homework assignments and trying to plan a workout or whatever I thought was important at that time. And it lasted about a week. And, and then it went away. So all of this to say... It's a very obvious route to success. I think if you looked for correlates among successful people, one of them is that they have some sort of organizational strategy, like a smart planning journal, a bullet journal, a a daily plan or whatever. But it's so hard to implement. It's not something that's a recognized formal part of almost any of the curriculums that I'm aware of. We kind of had to shoehorn it into the physical education course, and it works well because you're able to blend it with the workout planning and the diet planning that that go Mm. into physical education. But why is... Something as obvious, something as simple and helpful as a smart planning model, so absent in in a lot of cases from education, but certainly absent from the daily health practices of of young people. The benefits of planning that I've seen, I think I can't speak to them in in high school, but I think they've come later in life as you become an adult and you realize the necessity and the benefits. But speaking from experience, I know the best things I've produced, accomplished, have all been the result of taking time and developing it in a series of steps whenever there's a deliverable, an assignment, not to do it in one sitting, but to make a plan, tackle it in sections. Yeah, that's Um, massive. I'm a big proponent now, but in high school, yeah, we may have a similar experience. Big shout out to School of Life, first of all. School of Life is, I I came to them as a YouTube page. Mm. Uh, I think, I hope I'm not wrong about this, that they are the brainchild of the philosopher Alain de Botton. As a teacher, It's one of those resources that you go back to time and again, because they'll give you these little well-made, visually appealing 10-minute clips explaining just about any uh, historical figure or specific philosophical idea. They also emphasize the importance of relationships a lot, and they talk in really clear terms, six to 10-minute videos explaining things like attachment theory, right? How to have a healthy argument with your partner, what you're missing in your memories of your childhood that could inform a better adult life. And they produce a lot of these physical resources like these cards. We've bought cards for our entrepreneurs club. I'll I'll ask you to just explain those in a second. Mm -hmm. But we've got one directly related to planning that we're looking to implement in a few of our clubs. But it's something like if everything went well, how would it be? And then we also have our cultural language and exchange club for students who are still on their English language learning great, like conversation starters, icebreakers, stuff to get people thinking. It's amazing to see how quickly language develops when you're talking about something you're interested in. Mm -hmm. No longer is it this step-by-step one, two, three process, but you're in the midst, you're you're immersed in it. The cards are amazing. Uh, So they're built around three themes. There's motivation, collaboration, inspiration. I think it's the third one. Nice. But they're little activities that you can do well organized. So the School of Life, huge fan. We, we are not sponsored by School of Life, incidentally. <laughs> this is just admiration. Pure admiration. But th- I think they're the first ones to make all this amazing merchandise related to holistic health, holistic wellness. It's so important to have those specific expressed ideas that you're not in the midst of forming while you're in front of the students. I find once you get into a classroom, it's very much like a fluid ecosystem. You're not this thing, this separate entity. You are really a part of it. And just like conversations like the ones we're having right now, if you don't have those landmarks or those touchstones, that relationship, that ecosystem can go in a lot of different directions, right? With Braemar Life Skills Academy, we're trying to identify all of these individual and we treat them as discrete or siloed aspects of health, the physical, the mental, the emotional, the relational, the communal, the financial, etc. Uh, but they're not, right? They, they are a fluid, constantly changing interaction. And meeting the, the needs of individual students with static programs, I think, probably doesn't work. So maintaining that sort of flexibility, that plasticity, if you will, has ended up being both the most educational experience of my life, but also fulfilling and challenging because it's not one thing. 
we want to wrap up just by making sure that we get to touch on your primary interest, your real specialty, and I think where you envision yourself playing an important role in education in the future. And I'm, I'm not going to give you too much of a runway on this one, <laughs> but talk to us about where you see business, entrepreneurial thinking, that type of innovative creativity, but also engagement with market forces. How, how does that play a role in students' lives now, and how does it help them in the future? Benefits for our students, I think it's the fastest road fastest discipline of those different subjects that we offer for students to develop themselves. One of your main focuses might be the pull idea. I think one of my main focuses might be actualization and the development of self. That's been something beneficial for me, myself. But I think of all the disciplines, business offers the fastest route to connect to, to find the gold of actualization. The deepest vein to find the gold. The development of a business plan, bringing something into being, selling a product, actually getting something into the market that you've created, something original, mm. a new venture. I think it's a direct route to developing yourself, finding what we're interested in. Some of the things we talk about with formally with management theory, but relates to the management of the self, we can apply it in all different areas of management. But the experience of taking ownership over something, moving it through, collaborating, and eventually functioning as a leader, I think is mm. one of the most effective ways to develop yourself, yeah. develop your potential. Do, do you think of actualization in, in that sort of Abraham Maslow conceptualization where 100%. it is the top of the, of what, the top of the pyramid of what we need? Do you see how things like security, belonging, self-esteem, recognition can be a part of that journey? Do you see your students as they're developing these ideas with you in need of that? Or, or is the, the act of this externalization of potential enough to get them to that actualization? The concept of actualization, according to Maslow, I think is synonymous with my interpretation mm -hmm. of it, that it's the thing that we're all interested in. It's our highest calling. I think it's placed within the hierarchy as Maslow has constructed. It's the ultimate goal. It's what secretly what we're seeking. And I think that this touches on everything we've mentioned today, but finding ways or giving ways for students to identify authenticity, authentic interests, authentic instincts, authentic skills and abilities. Maybe what all of this is about, maybe is what education should more clearly be about, finding a route to actualization. When a student sees something that they are naturally interested in, being recognized by a teacher, being encouraged, being informed by material that they're working with, and then they get to see how that expression improves. That's pull motivation better. for me right there. Unbelievable. Our only experience with Mike is as the director of activities and programs. But Mr. Helsby has distinguished history as our English teacher and expert. If I can ask you to go back to those days, bring up your experience with literature and English, speaking about English, what are the benefits for students mm. around storytelling, rites of passage, what we learn from literature? Thank you for asking me about uh, oh, literature. Sure. I, I sometimes forget that was my first love. I got we into don't forget. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, never no. forget. I got into reading because I did not want to be seen by the the students around me when I was in high school as nothing but a, a jock. I didn't want to be uh, monovalent in that sense, or, or uh, I didn't want to be pigeonholed. So I saw this whole other group of people and this whole other way of being and thinking, which often is on a social polar opposite to the athletic life and the life of the body. I do miss teaching it, and I'm frustrated by the position of English and English literature in our education system in the same way that I'm frustrated with the position of physical education and music and home ec and basic home repair and financial management and all these things that we need all these things that we know young people need and that are underserved. And that is just my opinion, but I, I think it's a pretty easily defensible one. Uh, it's hard to give a, a solid answer to how does literature help a student? What is literature for? And so I often revert to talking about storytelling and I revert to talking <laughs> about rites of passage. Northrop Fry. Northrop Fry. Does, does that play Whoo! involved? There? We are in the Braemar Podcast Studio, literally looking out the window at the University of Toronto, uh, St. George Campus, where the Northrop Fry building proudly stands, and I'm proud of that. Yeah, motive for metaphor. The Massey Hall speeches and the anatomy of criticism. Maybe the greatest literary critic of the modern era, Northrop Fry, talked about why do we create metaphors? so often. Why are metaphors the primary mode of conversation and speech? We know sitting here how many analogies we've had to make, how many comparisons we've had to make just to make our points. That's storytelling. 
right? That's crafting a narrative. That's building categories where they may not exist. And so I'm convinced that the ability to tell stories does two very important things. Uh, one, it helps us to structure our existence. We are mm -hmm. narrative beings. If you look back on your life, even the idea of looking back it doesn't necessarily represent our actual real position, but it sure seems like we're living out a story. It sure seems like I am the hero or the protagonist of my story. And my subjectivity makes it feel as though I'm going through a rising action after my exposition and I'm heading towards a, some sort of climax. That's certainly how it feels. That's how we talk about actualization, like a climax. We know what the resolution and the denouement and the conclusion are going to be. But in as much as we think that way, the more able we are to craft story, the more able we are to comprehend, understand, and communicate our own lives. Right. So I think that's first and foremost what we're teaching students. It's a sneaky <laughs> way to teach students that. And I don't even know that a lot of people know that's what they're teaching. But that's how I regard stories. The other thing that, that all great literature does is teach us to empathize. It, it may be the greatest mm. mindful empathy exercise that exists. Since Charlotte's Web or Stuart Little or Chronicles of Narnia or whatever it is that gets you into reading, you are being intentionally taught to jump your subjectivity out of your own head and into the life of another person. And the more you enjoy a story is directly correlated with your success in doing that. Are you able to inhabit the experience of another person? And if you do that with enough books and you get enough joy from it, you get enough of that pull motivation from it, you find yourself empathizing with the people in your lives. Not all the time, but in the same way. It's like building a muscle. So I think books are maybe the best weight room for emotional intelligence that there is. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah, you like that? On that good line, I think we're going to uh, wrap up here. Boy, Jimmy O, James Olson, uh, a real pleasure. Thanks for being thank here for so the much. first ever Braemar podcast. I, I think that went quite well. And thank you. Thank you. Okay, goodbye. And be sure to not miss our next episode, where I'll be talking to two more Braemar students, Amir and Matilda about how exercise and fitness inform their student lives.